medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk about a turning point here in a major disease treatment. This is the results of a phase three multi-center, double-blind, randomized controlled trial showing that a medication that's pretty simple can actually reduce the mortality at 28 days in a very common diagnosis. In this case, it's severe community-acquired pneumonia. Now, it's not every day that you get this kind of a study. So the quick of it is that in people admitted to the hospital with severe community-acquired pneumonia, and we'll talk about this, when they did a randomized controlled trial of 800 subjects, and this was done in France, they found that an infusion of hydrocortisone over 8 or 14 days, depending on the criteria, showed a reduction in mortality at 28 days from 11.9% in the placebo group to 6.2% in the intervention group. And at 90 days, that held up at 14.7% in the placebo group to 9.3% at 90 days in the intervention group. And then when they looked at the incidence of intubation at day 28, that means they'll need to be intubated, have a tube put down into their throat and put on a mechanical ventilator. It was 29.5% in the placebo and 18.0% in the intervention arm. In terms of the use of vasopressors at day 28, 25 down to 15.3. And by the way, all of these here were statistically significant. With hydrocortisone being used which could generate excess blood sugar, they did note in the short term here an increase in insulin that was required to keep their blood sugars in the normal range. But overall, here's the big numbers right here. 28-day mortality was reduced almost in half. And so let's talk a little bit about this study. There's some details under the hood, but a pretty landmark study. So the first thing that you need to know is the inclusion criteria, because this is not for all patients with pneumonia that come into the hospital. So first of all, they had to be 18 years old, and that's important. They had to have been diagnosed with community-acquired pneumonia. So this is important to understand because we're not talking about pneumonia that may have occurred in the hospital. This is a patient who is living in the community and developed a community-acquired pneumonia with symptoms of cough, purulent sputum, chest pain, shortness of breath, and a diagnosis within 48 hours. So this could not have been going on for more than 48 hours. There had to be some abnormal imaging, either on a chest x-ray or a CT scan. And they had to have started intervention early within the first 24 hours and have received antibiotics already. In terms of the severity, this was severe pneumonia. So the thing that you should understand here is that the PORT score, the PSI score, had to be greater than 130. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. So I've gone over to the folks here at MD Calc, which has a number of well-done calculators for clinical scores that we use all the time in medicine. And this one's called the PSI port score for pneumonia severity. And so you can see here, you simply put in, for instance, the age of the patient. Let's say here that the patient is 75 years of age. So that already gives us 85 points here. We can say that it's a male. That'll raise it to 95 points. Let's say it's a nursing home resident. Let's say that they've got some renal disease. And you can already see quickly that we're racking up points here. Let's say they're breathing over 30 and that their pH is less than 7.35. Their sodium is less than 130. And they have a pleural effusion on the x-ray. That gives them 185 points. And you can see very quickly that we can rack up these points. And these points are predictive in terms of prognosis. So we will put a link in the description below so you can calculate the port score on patients that are coming into the hospital and you can get an assessment about how high the mortality risk is. And you can see here 27 to 29.2% mortality. If we back off on this a little bit and we get down to 130, which is the cutoff, let's go to around 130 points. You can see here that we're talking almost a 10% mortality. That's the type of mortality that we're looking at here with severe pneumonia. So as we talked about here, the PSI score should be at least 130. The patient could be on mechanical ventilation with a PEEP of at least 5. That's the positive and expiratory pressure. The patient could also be on non-invasive ventilation. That would be like BiPAP. The patient could be on high flow with an FiO2. That means the amount of oxygen of at least 50%. And what we call a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 300. So here we're looking at the amount of oxygen in the blood, which is the PaO2, divided by the decimal point of how much oxygen they're on. So if they're on 50%, it would be 0.5. 
For that, it would have to be less than 300. Just to give you an idea what normal is, a normal PaO2 is around 100, and of course we're breathing 0.21. So 100 divided by 0.21 would be about 500. So 500 is normal, and as it goes down, it gets worse and worse. Or they could be on a partial rebreathing mass with a bag reservoir, so long as the PaO2 is less than these numbers, given this much oxygen that they're on. So again here, they have to have at least one of these. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a severe one from this standpoint. It could be from any one of these would give you an inclusion criteria into the study. Further on, they mentioned that the patient should not be on vasopressors from the start, like would be in septic shock. We'll talk about why that's the case in just a minute. They also said that it could not be an aspiration pneumonia. That means where you aspirate the contents of your stomach down into your lungs. A post-obstructive pneumonia, as would be the case in, for instance, a lung cancer that's blocking the airway to the portion of the lung and it's causing a pneumonia from that. Could not involve cystic fibrosis, active tuberculosis, fungal infections, the flu, which is a viral pneumonia, or be immunosuppressed. And that's because of the use of steroids can cause immunosuppression. No history of mechanical ventilation within the past 14 days prior to admission, so that would be an exclusion criteria, and not be on antibiotics for more than seven days, unless, of course, they grow out a resistant organism. No need for hydrocortisone for another problem, and that's important to understand because septic shock potentially is another one of those problems. Part of the criteria for treating septic shock is the use of hydrocortisone in that case, specifically 50 milligrams IVQ6. And so they wanted to make sure that people that were entering this study were getting the standard of care because in this study, of course, they could have been randomized to placebo and we would not want to give placebos to patients who actually needed to have hydrocortisone. So that's an ethical reason to say no need for hydrocortisone for any other problem. They also wanted to make sure that there was no issues with subjects being pregnant now that we have the inclusion and exclusion criteria down, let's talk about how the study went down. They actually started out with almost 6,000 patients, and they whittled that down to 800 patients. And why is that the case? This is a pretty big dropout, and it's one of the drawbacks of this study, I would say. But when they followed their inclusion and exclusion criteria, this is kind of the natural result, because out of 5,948, 5,148 were excluded. Why is that? because 1,200 of them had septic shock, because almost 600 of them had inhalational pneumonia, that's an aspiration pneumonia. 547 did not meet the severity criteria. 417 had a diagnosis with influenza, and they were excluded. And 363 received corticosteroids for other medical conditions, and so forth. All the way down, you can see that what they were left with were 800 subjects, and they randomized those to those two groups. So they had 400 in the intervention group, which was the hydrocortisone group, and you had 400 in the placebo group. And those did not receive hydrocortisone, but rather the placebo. So this was a double-blinded study. Exactly how did they give the hydrocortisone in this study? It was actually by continuous infusion, not 50 milligrams IVQ six hours, but actually through continuous infusion. And they did something at day four. So here's a little stop sign here. After day four, they had to make a determination about whether or not they would continue to give 200 milligrams a day continuous infusion and whether they would go to day eight or continue on to day 14. And that decision was made based on these four possibilities that were looked at all as one. So in other words, you had to have all four of these to go to just day eight. So here we are at day four, and they've gotten 200 milligrams daily continuous infusion, and they make a decision. Is the patient breathing spontaneously? If the answer is yes, they would go on. Is the PF ratio greater than 200? Remember, the lower the number here, the worse the patient is. Is the PF ratio greater than 200? If the answer is yes, then they would move on. Has the SOFA score improved? This is a score looking at the genuine sickness of the patient. If the SOFA score had improved since the patient was admitted and started treatment, then they would move on. And finally, they would ask the question, is the patient likely to be discontinued or deceed on day 14? If all four of these were meeting the criteria, then they would go to the eight-day treatment. If one of these was missing, then they would do the full 14-day treatment. Of course, it would stop after the patient left the intensive care unit.
Let's look at these results again. So here we have 800 subjects, severe cap, as we mentioned before, randomized to either 8 or 14 days of hydrocortisone or placebo. And as you can see here, the relative risk reduction going from 11.9% down to 6.2% on 28 days was a 48% relative risk reduction. That's pretty large. When you can cut your mortality rate in half, that's a pretty good intervention. And this was a phase three multi-centered, double-blinded, randomized controlled trial. And so this is simply one paper published in one journal. And we'll have to see exactly what the regulatory bodies decide. So these would be like the Infectious Disease Society of America and the American Thoracic Society. When they meet, they come up with what their consensus recommendations are. I'm sure they're going to be looking over this paper and they may make a recommendation that people who fit this category should be getting hydrocortisone continuous infusion. For those of you who are interested in the statistics of this, the absolute risk reduction was 5.7%, which means that they would have to treat 18 patients in this category to save one life. And I'll tell you, a number needed to treat of 18 is a pretty good number. The lower the number, the better. Of course, if you're talking about people falling out of planes and parachutes, the number needed to treat is one. As the number goes up from there, that means the intervention is less efficacious. So a number of 18 is actually pretty good. Notice it also held up at 90 days. And intubation, we've already went over this, and incidence of vasopressors. All of these are statistically significant. So we've talked about the benefits of hydrocortisone in terms of reducing mortality. What about the risks? Whenever you give hydrocortisone, we talked about the issues with glucose and the fact that blood glucose levels will be higher and that will require more insulin. That's fine, so long as we can keep blood sugars under control. The other two areas that you need to look at whenever you're giving somebody steroids is whether or not it's going to cause an ulcer in the stomach and therefore cause GI bleeding. You should be happy to know that there was no statistical difference in the hospital-acquired infections, which is another complication of steroids, immunosuppression, or gastrointestinal bleeding at all. In fact, in the hydrocortisone group, they were actually numerically lower. So they were trending to being lower actually in the hydrocortisone group, but it was not statistically significant. So I think this would change my practice. If I had a patient that fit this category, I would look into and talking to the pharmacy about doing a continuous infusion of hydrocortisone that is tapered appropriately based on that day four assessment. And for those of you who want to learn more about treating pneumonia in the hospital, we have a course on medcram.com titled Pneumonia Explained Clearly where we go over the different diagnoses, risk factors, and treatments for pneumonia in the hospital and also in the outpatient world. It's gotten over 180 reviews and 4.8 out of 5 stars. So I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com for these and other videos on other medical topics and also continuing medical education credits. Thanks for joining us.